sharpen pencils, clear your desk. It's time to increase your nerdiness with Derek. Hello, welcome again to Increase Your Nerdiness. I'm Derek W. Truesdale, the internet's most frugal nerd. Uh, This is the podcast for people who would use algebra on a daily basis. Or perhaps you might carry a compass inclinometer in your toolbox. Yes, I am actually guilty of that. Well, today we're going to be discussing bits, bytes, and binary in just a moment. Uh, And we'll talk about that discrepancy, like if you go to the store and buy a, quote, 300 gigabyte hard drive, and it turns out you only have 279 of those. What the heck? Why does that happen? Uh, I'm going to get to the video comments first, though, and starting this week, you'll be able to skip to the actual lesson if you want to do that. I'll put up the actual time to which you need to fast forward if you don't want to hear any of this stuff. But I love to respond to the video comments so that uh, I can answer any follow-up questions we have from last week. All right, last time we talked about color subsampling. And I had an interesting question on that from Harmful Grave Mind One, who says uh, he has a question of YUV versus RGB. Now uh, he actually uses Fraps, which is highly regarded as a, the best screen capturing program, and it gives you the option to record to either YUV or in RGB. And it, of course, it warns you in RGB that. Um, It might be slower and not work as good. And he wants to know why that is. Well, the reason for that is with color subsampling, the beauty of it is it allows you to save space and save some processing power because it's fewer pixels. The color is sampled at smaller resolutions than the brightness of your image. Now, when you go full RGB, there's no subsampling. You're you're taking the color and the brightness of every single pixel on the entire screen, and it's just more information to work with, which is more thinking, and it can really slow your machine down. Now, some of us might have experienced this kind of a pain in video rendering uh, when you're doing color corrections and uh, things of that sort. You can really slow down your machine doing that because it, it's just more information. And to do it in a highly detailed way, it just uh, it's sort of uh, it just comes with what you're doing. All right, next question is from Mitten here. And he's actually a uh, filmmaker. He's still in high school, but he records digital video films, one of which has already had a movie premiere. So that's really cool. So he has a very relevant question. Uh, He asks, how can I avoid banding when creating videos? Because it's consistently a problem for me. Is it something I have to deal with? Or is it something I have to look out for while shooting? Now, last week I did talk about banding and how color uh, color subsampling is one of the reasons that your video can end up in lower quality with some artifacts, but that's not the only thing going on with DV. So I'm going to attempt to deal with with a lot of the issues here of DV, not just the color subsampling, uh, because lots of problems can be caused, and hey, let's address as, as many of those as possible. Again, it's not just the banding color subsampling, there are other issues And the reason is, I was talking about how our brains are so good at finding patterns that when you watch compressed video, many of the artifacts, the little imperfections, tend to appear on the edges of things. And our brains are very good at picking that out. So whether it's uh, a lower bit rate than you should be using or some kind of color subsampling, that is where we notice it. And you kind of have to be aware of this as you film with digital video. Now, video cameras just, they see things differently with their sensors than um, film sees the light that is uh, exposed on it or whatever the proper term is. It's two different worlds. And the thing that film is really good at is restoring and, and maintaining detail to the really bright areas 
like this. Now there's a cool feature on a lot of video cameras. It's called zebra stripes and I'm looking at them on my camera right now and on my white shirt there are a couple spots that are zebra striping. And what that means is you can actually visually see on the display if anything is too bright for the camera to pick up. Now the audio equivalent of this is uh, it, if, if your audio gets too hot, if someone shouts too loud into the mic and the levels go past what the computer can sample, it ends up creating this square kind of wave where there's not the definition and the nice flowing up and down, it's just the maximum volume and it really sounds horrible. You want to avoid that. It's called clipping. Well, in the video world, things could be clipped too. You can actually view this if you look at a histogram of your image. You might see that the very bright colors are getting clipped off. The zebra striping allows you to see exactly where that's happening. Now, if it's just one little part of my shirt and the rest of me is in pretty good detail, I don't care. But the problem is... If I was to take this camera outside and have a bright wintry forest behind me and the whole background was getting zebra striped and clipped off, that would be an indication that something is wrong. There are a couple ways to handle this. You basically have a choice. You can either brighten up your subject, your actor, to hopefully get them in kind of the same range as the background. And the way to do that is with a reflector. I mean, you could even take a pizza box and put some tinfoil on it and have some dude uh, bounce sunlight into your actors' faces, which <laughs> might be kind of annoying to them, but it might make the actors brighter. Uh, one of the things to look out for, I noticed this actually in one of your films, is on a bright sunny day, if actors are in the shade, those shadows can look horrible to a video camera and you really want to bring your your brightness into the same range like I'm saying here so either try to brighten the actors up or the other thing to do is it's called teching it down so if I was really concerned about the detail in my shirt instead of wearing a pure white shirt I would wear a slightly kind of a shade of gray shirt and I'm pretty sure this is what they would do on Sesame Street, for example. If there's some kind of a monster with white googly eyes, they would probably be teching it down and making the eyes some kind of darker shade of gray and not pure white. So to the camera, it's pretty much white, uh, but it's not all the way up, so it's clipping. Anytime there's clipping, that can be a problem. And then, hey, another thing just to do for fun is um, you can get one of those 35 millimeter adapters. And I believe that they allow your, um, I was actually gonna invent one of these until I found out that they already existed. <laughs> Basically, what it does is, it, for example, if you were to shoot on film, there is, say, 35 millimeter film, which is pretty large, larger than any video camera's sensor would be which allows you to get a nice, uh, you can play with focus more, and also you have access to more professional photographic lenses that are gonna look better than on your video camera. But I believe the other thing it can help you with is capturing to this uh, 35 millimeter adapter, it, it literally has this one 35 millimeter thing that you point your camera at and uh, it, so it's like this giant lens thing on the front of your camera. You want to have the right equipment and stuff to stabilize that. But that allows you to... Uh, you might find it's easier to get colors in the same range with that and get a more professional look. So that's another thing you could do, especially if you're uh, doing a feature film. Oh, and the, the one other thing that this might help you on digital video, especially if you're doing chroma key, you know, green screening, blue screening, stuff like that. Remember, we learned that the color is subsampled and it's not as... It, it's not in as great detail as brightness. So if you're using color as the distinction between your actor and the background, it's going to look very blocky on the edges. And it can end up looking pretty lousy and horrible. So one of the things you could do is you can apply something called chroma blur. I know Sony Vegas allows you to do this on its chroma key 
uh, function. And what it does is it, it instead of having just a nice blocky 4x4 four four edge, it blurs the stuff together, giving you a bit more of a, a, a fluid line instead of just a bunch of nasty blocks on the edge. So applying chroma blur in areas where your edges look bad is another thing you can do. And I'm pretty darn sure something like After Effects would uh, allow you to do that too. Anyway, on to today's lesson. We're going to talk about bits, bytes, and binary. Now this is an issue of how computers think versus how our number system is. Now, I'm sure most of you know we have a base 10 system, probably owing to the fact that most of us still have 10 of our fingers, and that's how we count. We have 0 through 9. You could count every single one of them. And then when we run out of, of uh, characters, then we move to 1, 0, which is 10 in our language. Well, computers quantify everything into a series of 1s and zeros. Each of those places where you can store either a 1 or a 0 is called a bit. And that's the cool thing about digital computing. There used to be analog computing before it. And it was subject to... Uh, it wasn't as precise as it is today. To um, if, if things weren't perfectly calibrated, if the temperature was a little bit off, you might not get the same information back. And... It's hard for us to imagine that today because, for example, with file sharing, if you were to send a file to, like, a hundred of your friends, hopefully it's legal for you to be doing that, but if you can send the same file to each of your friends and you know they're all going to get it exactly the same because it's either one or a zero, and if something's wrong, it'll it'll resend it again. It, it makes sure it absolutely makes for certain that you're sending the exact same information and, and they're getting it. And every time you connect to the internet, it's actually doing some air checking and say, hey, this is what I'm getting. Is this right? And the other end says, yep, okay, here's the next part. And it, it makes sure checking every step of the way that you're getting the right information. That's the whole point of binary and that's why computers think in that way. So anyway, we have these bits and instead of thinking in powers of 10, like we usually do, uh, where in our real world examples, we have thousands, which would be like a kilo, right? Millions, billions, and trillions. You've heard these numbers uh, applied to government budgets, for example. Well, in the computer world, we have an equivalent of that, of uh, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, and terabytes. However, remember, Computers are all bits, okay? And because you have two possibilities in every single bit, our numbers get a little bit off. So, for example, if you just had one bit, there are two possibilities. If you had two bits, now you have four possibilities. You double it. So you have zero and then one, and then one zero and one one. Four different possibilities with just two bits. And we can scale this up with 2, 4, 8, uh, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, and 1024. That's a kilobyte. So when we would call something that's 1,000 a kilo, computers call something that's 1,024 uh, bytes big. That is a kilobyte. That's how computers think. Now, to save you a little bit of work, that's 2 to the 10th power. And uh, so if you take 2 and multiply it 2 by itself 10 times, you get 1,024, a kilobyte. And then if you have 1,024 of those, you have a megabyte and so on and so forth. So 2 to the 10th, that's a kilobyte. 2 to the 20th, a megabyte. 2 to the 30th, a gigabyte. That's how it works, and that's why it's a little bit off. So in our decimal system, we would think of a megabyte as being a million bytes. But in computer land, I'm going to pull out my calculator. We will say 2 to the uh, 20th. It's actually 1,048,576 bytes. So that's how that works. 
let's move on to the to the next little difference between how uh, the computer land and, and some other issues that can come up. And that is the issue of a byte. Remember, I told you computers uh, think in bits. Each one of those can store two different possibilities. But we actually break these down into, well, bite-sized chunks. And at one time, it, it was kind of a... There's no thing that's etched in stone that says exactly how many bits makes a byte. But at one point, it was decided that a byte would be eight bits, which gives you 256 different possibilities. And we're going to get to the relevance because there are a couple places this comes up, one of which is on your keyboard. When you type things in, there's a standard called ASCII, which is A-S-C-I-I. Look it up if you want to know the exact uh, meaning of, of that acronym. But whenever you type a character on your keyboard, it assigns it a value that takes up a byte, and, and whichever key you type, that's some kind of a number that is sent uh, to your computer, you know, the rest of it to think about. And so any of the keys that you could type can be stored in a byte. Actually, it can be stored in seven bits, and they use the extra bit for error correction and stuff like that. Now, a couple times that you'll encounter that is with ASCII, where each character is basically a, a byte. And then the other time is in with colors. Remember, we've been talking about RGB color and, and, and things like that. If you're to go into Photoshop or some kind of a paint program and select a color, well, now you can pick for red, green, and blue. Each of them can be stored. Uh, you get one byte's worth to represent each color. So from 0 to 255, meaning 256 possibilities, 0, 0 would be uh, no color, no blue, you know, red, green, or blue, whichever one you're on. And then uh, actually FF is the value for 256, but that's a hexadecimal thing. We won't really deal with that too much. But for each pixel, you have three the three different colors, and you have one byte's worth of, of color where you can pick your color, and that's why. So color is sent in bytes, and uh, so is ASCII that we use all the time. Now, how is this relevant to video making? Well, the thing is, bit rates, now that we understand that there's a difference between a decimal megabyte and a binary megabyte, depending on how you measure, um, bit rates for your internet connection speed or the bit rate of a video that you're watching, like this one, are often measured in bits rather than bytes, okay? So uh, remember, when your file is eventually stored on disk, it's going to be stored in bytes. But bit rates are measured, not surprisingly, in bits. So there's a conversion to figure out from one to the other. And then the other thing is, um, did I say, yeah, <laughs> I'm getting confused here. Yeah, there's uh, bits versus bytes. So a byte is eight times bigger than a bit, and then uh, a bit is an eighth of a byte. And then the other thing is binary versus decimal. You've got two things to consider here. Now, there's actually an equation that you could figure out. I've figured it out before. I, I have it on one of my blog posts. Maybe I'll put it up somewhere again. But the basic formula is your file size in bytes equals 128 times the number of seconds in this video or audio stream times your bit rate, which would be measured in kilobytes Per second, and so with just that information, you can say, "All right, I've got a file. It can only be 20 megabytes big, or I can't email it to my friends, or maybe a certain website only allows you 100 megabytes." Well, you can actually sit down with a calculator on a desert island or something and figure out exactly how many bits you can dedicate to each second of this video. 
Now, thankfully, you don't have to do all this stuff in your head. There are things, handy things called bitrate calculators. So just go to a search engine, type in bitrate calculator, and there are some fantastic ones to use. Um, so if you want to figure out what bitrate should I use for this video to not have a huge file and get, you know, 100 megabytes worth of video through, uh, you can work both ways. You can work from file size or the length of the video, whatever you want to do. Uh, using a bitrate calculator is a great way to get as much quality as possible as you encode your video. So that's actually just about it for this week's Increase Your Nerdiness. And remember, if you want to know, if you want to be a true nerd, you kind of have to know about bits, bytes, and binary. It's just sort of a fun thing to have in your toolbox. Anyhow, see you next time. Thanks for tuning in again to increase your nerdiness. You can find this podcast at DerekForPresident.com. By the way, last week I was sick, so there was no podcast. But from now on, we should be going on like normal. Uh, you know, if I can't talk, it makes it difficult to do a podcast. But uh, as long as my health is up and everything, we'll, we'll keep going. I didn't forget about you guys. I just took a week off. But uh, we'll see you next time on Increase Your Nerdiness. Sharpen pencils, clear your desk. It's time to increase your nerdiness with Derek.